good evening, everyone, and welcome to Flint Central Church of the Nazarene, as tonight we're going to have a time of worship and a time of Bible study together. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, we're going to sing some songs of worship, and while we do that, uh, you can feel free. There's a number there at the bottom of your screen. If you have any prayer requests or needs, please go ahead and text that number and uh, make us aware of your prayer requests, and Pastor uh, John Gildner is going to pray for those things, and uh, Pastor Rob will be bringing us a word from the Lord in just a bit. But first, we're going to sing some songs of praise to the Lord, because even in the midst of all trials and troubles, we can still raise a hallelujah. I'm 
Hallelujah. Even in our darkest troubling times. Again, I invite you, if you have any prayer needs, please text that number at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to take those to the Lord shortly. And also, if you're there alone, invite somebody to come and watch this stream along with us. We need the Lord each and every day.
chapter 4, Paul writes these words, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So that's what we're going to do in this time together. Uh, we've received several who have commented on the Facebook stream or have sent me uh, text messages. So now let us let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is good to be joining with brothers and sisters um, from our from our church, from our community, um, to be gathered in your presence no matter where we are. We know that you are near. We know that you are with us. We know that your faithfulness precedes us. Lord, it's in light of your faithfulness that we draw near to you, knowing that you have been faithful, you will be faithful, you are faithful now. And so, Lord, again, it's with confidence that we can draw near to you and offer those requests that have been named. We, we pray for, for Rossi's grandpa. We pray for Lisa Faulkner, for Amy Strang and the uncertainty that she's feeling. We pray for Joan McCabe as uh, she has many family and friends in the hospital. We pray for Jaden as fear and anxiety are consuming her. Lord, would you be her all? Would you provide for her? We pray for those families with loved ones in the hospital, some on life support and the families unable to be near, but how that grips us. And we just long to, to be near one another and to, uh, to touch, to just be close. And so, Lord, we pray that your presence would uh, would go the distance where, where we can't, would transcend those boundaries um, where we are unable. We pray, Lord, in the midst of all that's going on and in, in the way that our economy has been impacted, we pray for small business owners, for those with service-related jobs, for medical staff. Lord, would you supply for, for all of their uh, needs? Would you sustain them um, during this time? Lord, we pray for our country and, and for our world. We pray that an end would come soon to the spread of this virus and that um, that we, and in the midst of that, that we would uh, exude the love of Jesus. Lord, for our neighbors, for co-workers, for, uh, for those who are shut in and can't get out, I pray that the love of Jesus Christ would just flow in and through us during this time. Lord, I am privileged um, to be able to, to bring
bring the request before you tonight. And I know that there are more. Um, and so, Lord, again, would you be near? Would you meet each person um, at their point of need tonight? At the end of Paul's letter, he concludes and he says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. This is our prayer. So church, may the peace of God transcend all understanding. Would that peace guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And we, we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. by his accomplishments. I'm so proud of him. You know, it means absolutely, maybe he'll be an engineer. I don't know. Well, I'm glad you're here. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be in the first eight verses of, of Philippians chapter 1. Go back with me in time, 2,000 years ago, to the city of Rome, city of gladiators and coliseums and the F Roman Forum. But we're not going to be traveling to the Colosseum or the Roman Forum. No, we're, we're going to find ourselves in a drab little room surrounded by very whole walls. If we could peek into that room, we would see a man probably seated on the floor. Uh, his shoulders might be stooped. His, his hairline might be receding. There's chains on his arms and on his legs. And right next to him is a Roman guard. It's the Apostle Paul. How would you describe Paul? If you're thinking of him, what, what, would, you, what would you say about Paul? How is, is he and how would he be described? Maybe you'd say, well, he's a great apostle, a great missionary. Uh, he traveled the known world. He was uh, planted a church seemingly in every port that he came to. One of the great minds in church history. But here he is chained to a Roman guard in a Roman prison, we know, and probably he knew, that his life 
wasn't going to be much longer here on planet Earth. So now, if, if you were him, how would you feel about that? Would you be on edge, maybe uh, uh, a little grumpy, stressed out? He's on death row. How would you, how would you describe your, your experience if you're on death row? Well, if we looked a little closer into that room, we'd see him writing a letter. Uh, maybe you'd think it's a resignation letter, a resignation to God. Ever since I started following you, God, on the road to Damascus, I've had nothing but trouble. There's been shipwrecks and prison stays and beatings and all the rest. In fact, I've, I've had it, God. This isn't what I signed up for. We would, maybe you would expect that coming from a guy who's sitting on death row, but this is no resignation letter. This isn't a complaint. This isn't the New Testament version of the book of Lamentations. Far from it. He's writing the letter that we're going to look at tonight, the, the letter from, to the Philippian church. It's not a list of grievances. In fact, the Philippian letter has been known as the epistle of joy. And it's not surprising, 16 times in four short chapters, Paul makes reference to joy or being joyful. It's finding joy in challenging times. That's what we're in right now. It's Paul's contention. I think we're going to see over the course of the next several weeks as different pastors lead us in this Bible study, we're going to see that, that Paul believes that joy can be found in spite of our circumstances, in any circumstance, that the Christian journey should be one of, of joy, that living for Jesus should be demonstrated by joy, even, even if you're in a Roman prison, even if you're facing challenging times. Even if you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, it seems like the news changes every single day about what's going to happen. But Paul, this prisoner, this Roman prisoner who's going to be executed, is still talking about joy. I think that's what intrigues me about this book. And when we were talking about what kind of Bible study would we want to do through this live streaming, we, it seemed like the obvious choice was the book of Philippians. Joy in spite of circumstances, boy, joy in, start, in spite of troubles, uh, in spite of when things might not be going our way, joy when dealing with things like COVID-19. Well, I think that's what we're going to discover in the next couple of weeks. I guess I know too many grumpy Christians, uh, should I say it that way, too many joyless believers. Can there be a joyless believer? I don't know if Paul would think that there could be a joyless believer. But, but I know folks who claim Jesus, and I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure they love Jesus, but their life is far better than what Paul's was in this Roman prison, set to be executed. And yet they don't seem to experience much joy. And I don't know when, when their co-workers look at them or their family members look at them or their, their fellow classmates that they see a person that's living in joy. Maybe they're full of I don't know, my uncle used to say you're full of baloney. Maybe they're full of baloney or full of lemon juice or full of something, but it doesn't seem like they're full of joy. I guess the question is, would people describe you as joyful? Here in the midst of all the things going on, COVID-19, national emergency, all the rest, people are hoarding toilet paper for crying out loud and, and just some of the basic things. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of worry, a lot of fear. But Paul is saying that we can still experience joy. That's what we're going to get at in, in, this, in this study. Over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to see Paul describing this Christian life, whatever you're going through, as being joyful. And, and, and so we're going to start tonight, Philippians chapter 1, just the first eight verses. Let me, let me read them to you. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. I know a lot of times I read from the New International Version, but tonight I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says this, This is the letter from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi, who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God, Whenever I pray, I make my request for you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. 
And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me a special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. What a great passage. You get a feeling that he really loves these people, that, that he, he longs to be with them. It, it, you get a feeling like maybe, I guess, in our language and, and lingo today, that he's quarantined in this prison in Rome and yet he's longing for his brothers and sisters who are in Philippi well like I said we're we're going to talk about this church you remember how the Philippian church started Acts chapter 16 gives us all the background I'll just give you the reader's digest version Paul has what Bible scholars call the Macedonian call he felt like the Holy Spirit was leading him to to plant the gospel in Europe and so that's exactly what he does. And his very first stop is Philippi. Paul's method of evangelism in those days was to go to uh, the Jews first. And so Philippi didn't have, it was a Roman colony. They were very proud of their Roman heritage. Uh, Philippi was named after King Philip, the father of uh, Alexander the Great. And so they were very Roman, very proud. See, there wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. So Paul, going to the Jews first, found out where they were at and they were meeting down by a river and so he went there and there he met a lady named Lydia Lydia was from Asia she was a convert to Judaism she was very wealthy she sold uh, a purple cloth and she was the very first convert the second convert you may remember the story was a demon possessed girl who was kind of following after Paul and Silas and eventually Paul got got fed up with her and and chase the demon out everybody was happy about that except the owners of that slave girl they were not happy at all in fact they had paul and silas thrown into prison well that demon possessed girl was convert number two when they were in prison that's the time when paul and silas at midnight were having a worship service after they'd been beaten remember that day thrown in jail if it would be me in, in prison at midnight after having been, meet, uh, been beaten that day, I don't know uh, what I'd be singing. I, don't, I think I'd probably sing Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen or something like that. But they were singing. They were singing hymns. They were praising the Lord. And that's when an earthquake happened and the doors of the prison uh, flung open and the jailer thought that everyone had escaped and was about ready to commit suicide because they had all escaped in his mind. And Paul said, no, 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 we haven't escaped. And Paul led that jailer to Jesus, convert number three. So that church, that church at Philippi, uh, is such a great example of, of the church. It's, it's got the very, very wealthy, Lydia. It's got the very, very poor, a former slave girl. It's got somebody in the middle, that Roman guard. There's, there's people uh, uh, who, who had a Jewish background, Lydia, the demon-possessed girl, I guess she, she didn't have any religious background. She's demon-possessed. And then the Roman guard probably uh, worshipped emperors like most of the Roman citizens would have done. They were from different backgrounds, different areas. The, the, Lydia was from Asia Minor. She wasn't from Philippi. The slave girl was probably a Greek. And again, the Roman guard would have been a Roman. So different backgrounds, different uh, heritage, different religious backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, and it all makes up the church. Maybe that's why Paul loved it so much. That's what the church is supposed to look like. It, it's that we find our commonality in Jesus Christ, that we find our hope. Well, we talked about it on Sunday morning this past, past week when, when Peter proclaimed, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's what the church proclaims. That's what they're proclaiming. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And so this church, this wonderful church, is who Paul then is writing to in this letter. Again, he's, he's giving us this, this gospel of this epistle of joy. Even, even in trying times, in challenging circumstances. And the first attribute of someone who can experience joy in the midst of trying times is right there in verse 1. 
Paul says this, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, I'm a slave to Jesus. What's a slave? It's a person that has no rights, isn't it? It's a person that does whatever the master, their master tells them they have to do. That's a slave. And Paul is saying, that's me. I'm a slave to Jesus. I am sold out to Jesus, in other words. See, I think that joyful living begins when we give up our rights and give them over to Jesus. What do you think it means to be sold out to Jesus? Think about that. When we say that we are sold out to Jesus, it means that Jesus has all of me, right? 100%, everything I am, everything I hope to be, I'm, I'm completely His. All my dreams, all my ambitions, all my hopes, all, my, all, all that, that makes up me, I am sold out to Jesus. You know, there's so many things that can rob us of our joy. You know, watching too much of the 24-hour news cycle. If you watch about COVID-19 24 hours a day, you're going to get depressed. You're going to get worn out. You're going to hear about all these things, and, and it'll bring you down. But it's not just that. Even when things like, like pandemics aren't going on, there's things that can rob you of your joy and, and spoil our joy. I think, I think the things that rob us of our joy are not resulting from what we give to God, but what robs us most of our joy is what we have kept from God. We say, all right, I'm going to just keep this little bit of my, myself to me, and I'm not going to give that over to, to Jesus at all. I'm just going to hold on to it, whatever it might be. And Paul is saying, I'm not holding anything back. I'm a slave to Jesus. That's where it begins. That's where joy begins. Then look at what he writes next. He says, I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and the deacons. The NIV in this says, says, I am writing to all the saints. When you hear the word saint, what, what's a saint? Is that a saint with somebody with a halo? Usually we, we think of saints today, we think they've got to be old, you know, weary, wrinkled up you know one foot in the grave ready to see jesus poor and troubled that's not what paul is saying not in this passage no he's saying he's talking to the holy people uh, he's talking to all those he says he says all those who belong in christ jesus or or the niv the saints in christ that's a, fra a favorite phrase of paul's in fact he says it 132 times in his letters either either those who are in the Lord or in Christ. What do you think it means? What does it mean to be in the Lord? What does it mean to belong to Christ Jesus? Kind of like how a bird is in the air or a fish is in the water or roots are in the ground. A believer is in Jesus, surrounded by Jesus, uh, permeated by Jesus. They belong to Jesus. In another letter, Paul, Paul writes what, uh, what we're talking about here. What does it mean to be in Christ? In Ephesians chapter 3, if you can f quickly flip over there, chapter 3, verse 17, 18, and 19, read this way. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That's what we're after. That's, that's what we're talking about. Those who belong to Jesus, those that are in Christ, they experience that fullness of life and power that comes from God. How are you going to make it, whether it's, it's this current storm or another storm down the road, you make it when you experience the fullness of life and power in Christ Jesus. In Christ, that's, that's where it all comes from. We've used that phrase before. You know people, sometimes we say people are into sports, 
<laughs> not these days, no sports being played, but, or they're into music, or they're into cooking, or they're, or they're into cars, something like that. That says they're really wrapped up in it. They, they eat it, sleep it, think it. That's what they talk about all the time. They're into it. I remember when my son Alex was a toddler. Oh my goodness, he was into everything. He was, he was into, into the dog food. He was into the toilet paper. We'd go in the bathroom and it'd be all out. One time he got into Carla's lipstick and there was lipstick all over him, all over this cream-colored chair we had, all over everything. He was into it. Paul is saying when we're into Christ, when we, when we belong to Christ, when we eat, think, drink up Jesus, when we're thrilled with Jesus, when we're excited about Jesus, we're grounded and rooted in Jesus. That's, that's where joy comes from. So, so joy, if you're following along, joy, joy-filled believers, they give up their rights, they're slave to Jesus. And that rest of that first verse, joy-filled believers are into Jesus, they're in Christ. And then thirdly, joy-filled believers experience the grace and peace of God. Did you see that in verse 2? May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Paul uses that greeting not just here in Philippians. He, he says that same thing to the Romans. He says that same thing in the Corinthians. Grace and peace. May you experience grace and peace. What's grace? When you think of grace, what do you think of? I know we sing the song Amazing Grace. But what's grace? How about this definition? The unmerited love of Jesus. May you experience the unmerited love of Jesus. And what's peace? How about this? The unmistakable presence of Jesus. So when we have the unmerited love of Jesus, coupled with the unmerited peace and presence of Jesus, that's when we can experience joy. No matter what's going on in the world around us, when we know that we have the unmerited, we didn't earn it, we couldn't buy it, we don't deserve it, but we have the love of Jesus, and we are permeated by the presence of Jesus in the midst of that storm, that brings peace, that brings joy. Well, the fourth point, I guess, that joyful believers recognize that they need each other. And I get that just in the personal flavor of these first eight verses. Verse 3 says, Every time I think of you, I give thanks for my, to my God. And then skipping down to verse 7, So it's right that I should feel this way about you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and defending and confirming the, the truth of the good news. You, you get the idea that Paul, he just loves this fellowship. It's, it's just being around God's people. It's a partnering, partnership between them, a fellowship with them. The Greek word here is koinonia. If you've been around church for very long, you've heard that word, and it seems like every church has a Sunday school class called the koinonia Sunday school class. And Paul's talking there not so much just about, sometimes it's, it's translated as just a fellowship, but I think it's something deeper than that. Paul's not talking about just kind of hanging out with each other, you know, over the tuna casserole. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about partnering together, partnering with a purpose. Uh, the purpose, he says in here, is, is defending and confirming the truth of the good news. That's, that's what he's getting at. That's big stuff. Joy-filled believers partnering together to reach our world for Jesus Christ, partnering together to face the challenges that come our way. What does that mean during a COVID-19 emergency? What can we do? It's well... It's partnering together to a hand. It's partnering together to care for our neighbors. It's partnering together to be the church, not the building. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being the people of God. People have experienced the, the love and peace, the joy of Jesus. And so they share that joy with others. So we share that joy with the, with the world that doesn't even always understand it. That's what partnering together is. And lastly, Paul says that joyful believers recognize that God's not done with us. Of course, we get that from the great verse, verse 6, 
when, when Paul says this, and I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Do you believe that? That, that, that God finishes what he begins. That God doesn't leave us high and dry. My favorite book title, not my favorite book, but my favorite book title, is a little book uh, that was printed by the Nazarene Publishing House, The Foundry, uh, uh, years and years ago. And I don't even remember off the top of my head what the author's name is, but I remember the title. And the title is, God never said we'd be leading at the half but he did say we'd win the game. It's a long title. <laughs> There's more, more words on the cover than there is actually in the book, I think. God never said we'd be leading at the half, but he did say we'd win the game. That's, I think joy-filled believers understand that, that, that we understand that God is at work. And don't miss the point. Look at, at, at verse 5 and verse 6. For, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news that Christ Jesus from the time you first heard it till now. So, there's a partnership with these believers and then he goes on to and I am certain that God who began that good work within you will complete it and will continue his work until it's finally finished on that day so it's it's a partnership we partner with each other and God completes what he starts and when we partner to with each other we can accomplish much much more than we ever could on our own and God enables us to do even more let me explain it this way Oh my goodness, it's probably been uh, 20 years ago. We were at, at General Assembly in Indianapolis. Ben was probably five or six years old, and he didn't know how to swim yet. Well, we, we uh, were staying in a hotel that had a swimming pool, and he wanted to learn how to swim, and so we said, all right, this is what we're going to do. Uh, uh, I, I said, I'll put my arms underneath you, Ben, and you you." kick your legs like there's no tomorrow and you move those arms like 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 you can't stop and you do that and before long you'll be on the other side of this pool and so that's what we did he got under my arms and he started kicking his legs and and moving his arms and i don't even think it took him to get to the other side of the pool he he made it there he was swimming and you know then after that we came back and we ended up having a pool here in michigan we had a pool in kansas and and ben became a little fish he was always in the pool and i think i think that little story that's the rob prince definition of verses five and six verses five and six i think the rob prince version says this listen central nazarene this is what you want to do you, you got a big task You've got to speak of grace and truth and love in the midst of a COVID-19 crisis. You've got a big world that needs Jesus Christ. That's a big job. You want, you want to see God's kingdom come in Flint as it is in heaven. That's a big job. Well, this is how it's going to, this is how it's going to happen. You start kicking and paddling. Kicking and paddling with all your might, partnering together, kicking and paddling. And I'm going to keep my arms, the Lord says, I'm going to keep my arms underneath you, and I'm going to hold you, and you're going to make it to the other side. See, joy-filled believers, they understand that. They get that. That God, who began this good work, is going to complete it. And when he's on our side, we're going to win, and, and, and he's going to finish it. And, it. and it may be in the middle of the game, we look up at the scoreboard, like that little book used to say. In the middle of the game, we look at the scoreboard, and, and we might not be winning. It might not seem like we're going to win. But joy-filled believers know that when God's involved, God always wins. And that we can always trust Him. He didn't say we'd be leading at halftime, but He did say we'd win the game. Here we go. We've we got to wrap this up. The life of joy. He, in these first eight verses, what's it take? You give up your rights. You become a slave to Jesus. You get into Jesus. You belong to Jesus. You're sold out to Jesus. You experience his grace, unmerited love, his peace, his immeasurable presence. We recognize we need each other. We partner together. And we realize that God's not done. He's going to complete it in us. That he's still working. He's still moving. And we can always trust him. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. 
I hope that you'll come back on next Wednesday, 6.30, same time, same channel. Join us between then at on Sunday, 9.30 or 11 o'clock. Be, be reaching out to one another. Our pastors, I think they have, have reached uh, out to about five or 600 of our people already this week, just letting them know we're praying for them, we're caring for them, getting some prayer requests. But that's not just the pastor's job. You do it too. If you know somebody uh, in your street or, or somebody that you know that, that you might think is lonely or just needs somebody to care for them or to reach out to them or to pray for them, do it. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. This is a time when we need to pull together, partner together, and God's going to see us. He's going to get us to the other side. That I guarantee. Let's pray before we go. Lord, so thankful for this time together. Thankful for these folks that have joined us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this Bible study each Wednesday night and bless our live streaming services on Sunday morning. Help us to keep reaching out to, to our neighbors and our friends to display that no matter what all's going on in the world, we can have joy. We can have deep down real joy that doesn't come from ourselves, but comes only from you. So thank you, Lord. We believe that you're going to teach us some great things in this study over the next several weeks. Be with us. Keep everybody safe and sound. We do pray for those that are, that are sick. We pray, Lord, for those that maybe have already lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be seen in the midst of all of this and that in all things we could trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.